Alrighty, so it's a bit past 1.45 when this uh, workshop is supposed to start, so I'm just going to get rolling here. So welcome, everyone. I hope you guys are enjoying the symposium so far. As you know, it's the first time it's back in person since COVID, which is really exciting. Uh, so in this workshop, we're going to be covering web scraping in Python. All right, so just a little bit about myself. My name is Harry Pachigola. I'm a junior here at the University of Connecticut. I'm majoring in computer science and mathematics and statistics. And uh, I'm also the vice president of the data science club here on campus. So obviously throughout this uh, presentation, we'll be going over some core ideas within web scraping. So the first thing I'll cover is like, just what is web scraping, how it works, and just why it's important. So we'll go more into the intuition behind web scraping in that section. Then we're going to jump over to a Jupyter notebook where we'll focus on the request beautiful soup and pandas libraries. So I'll go over some toolkits that you can use in terms of getting data from a web page. And I'm going to briefly cover Selenium and SQL. Now Selenium and SQL are very powerful. They present a whole different way of uh, how you can scrape the web. So I'm only introducing the ideas here, hopefully as motivation for you guys to look further on from what I tell you here. But it's going to be a brief introduction to those packages. Then I'll talk about the legality of web scraping. Unfortunately, it's not legal to scrape all the websites and the specific data. So I'll tell you how you can pick and choose what websites to scrape from. So we'll first start off, obviously, by talking about some of the intuitive ideas behind web scraping. Now, web scraping at its core, right, can be simply defined as extracting data from a web page, right? And data comes in all kinds of forms. You can have textual data, you can have dates, you can have numbers, you can have images, you can have almost anything. Right? And generally speaking, anything on a web page can be considered as data. Now, obviously, this data has to be stored somewhere. And because it's stored in somewhere, the web browser is able to render it onto the screen. So more specifically, it's stored in the HTML of a web page. So just to simply show you that, if I go over here to NFL.com, this is Tom Brady's site on NFL.com. And notice how there's a good amount of data here, right? You have his name, his number, the team, whether he's an active player or not, and so much more. So on many modern browsers, if you hit Control Shift I, it'll take you to some of the HTML regarding the actual web page. If you click on this small icon over here and select specific component, it shows you where in the HTML that specific part of the web page is located. So clearly you can see here that Tom Brady's weight, which is a decently relative uh, data point, if that's something you're looking for, is stored right here in the HTML. And the same is true for everything else. All the images, all the numbers and text is stored in the HTML. And that's very important for us because we need to be able to locate where the data is. And it's right here. It's pretty obvious that it's in the HTML. So going back to the slides a bit. So all the data is in the HTML. And that's a very important idea that I'm going to stress and repeat myself multiple times. So before I go any further, I'm going to zoom out here. I'm going to talk about the data science pipeline. Now, many of you guys probably came across this pipeline and the steps involved in it because it's pretty important for any data science or analytics project, right? You first start off by asking a question. And like all data-oriented questions, you need data for it. So that's what the second step is about. The second step is getting data. Now, nowadays, you can get data on practically everything, right? There's many governmental websites that have free, freely available data. You have many APIs with a free API key. You can get data from them. And there's also, like, source of lots of pre-built data sets, right? I mean, I bet all of you guys here have heard of Kaggle, right? So there's lots of data on there. I think, like, honestly, yesterday when I was looking at it, I found a data set on Walnuts, right? My point being is that, like, you can find data on anything nowadays, right? So after that step is like the main like meaty part, right? You clean up your data set because there's going to be bias in your data set. There's going to be misformatted values. And then you go on to modeling and validating. You go in this little loop before you deploy it, right? So the reason why I skimmed over the last few steps is because web scraping really fits into the beginning part of the project, into the very first few steps of the data science pipeline, where you need to get your data and you want to gather that data. And there's a few advantages that web scraping offers over pre-built data sets. For example, with the pre-built data set, you're not in complete control over the data source, how the data is being collected, and maybe the different features of your data set. And web scraping gives you complete control over this. You can choose where your data sources are, which is the specific web page you'll be scraping. You can choose how many features of the data set you're going to have, and so much more. So there's a lot of flexibility involved with web scraping, and it's pretty simple. So that's what I'll be talking about. You guys, welcome. So before I continue, I want to lay out some four general steps for web scraping. And these are four steps that I like to follow the most. So I'll walk you guys through this later on in an actual Jupyter Notebook session. But the first thing you do is obviously find a data source, right? So in this case, we'll be scraping data from NFL.com. So that'll be our data source. That's the web page we'll be scraping our data from. The next step is to get the HTML. So like I just showed previously, all the data is stored in the HTML. So it makes sense that you need to be able to access that HTML to grab specific parts of it. And grabbing specific parts of it is the third step, right? Like I said, if I go back here, 
Tom Brady's weight in this sense, right, is stored in this part of the HTML. It's not above, it's not below, it's nowhere else in the HTML except for that specific part. So how do we get that specific part of the HTML? How do we extract it? Well, that's what the third step is all about. And we'll be using CSS selectors for that. Once again, if you're not familiar with HTML or CSS, the next slide is dedicated to that. So just bear with me for now. And obviously the last step is storing your data, right? There's no point in extracting the data if you're not gonna store it. And you store the data for later parts of the data science pipeline when you clean up your data and then you model your data, et cetera. So I mentioned a lot about HTML and CSS just now. So I'm just gonna go a bit deeper into those, right? HTML just stands for hypertext markup language. And it's a basically a way to tell the web browser how to display data and media onto the web page. Right, so right here is a very simple HTML document. And just notice a few things here, right? We have a body and then a closing body tag. We have H1 and then a closing H1 tag. So syntactically speaking, HTML is made up of a bunch of tags and everything between the tag has a specific meaning. So take this P tag, for example, right? The P tag tells the web browser that this is a paragraph. So everything between there is a paragraph. Say the H1 tag. Everything between the H1 tag stands for a header. So when the web browser receives this information, it knows to render the screen by specifying that this here is a paragraph, this here is um, a header for the exact article. So obviously it's a simple one here, but there's a downside of HTML, which is that it doesn't tell you how to visually structure the elements on the web page. So say that you want the background color to be red, you want there to be some kind of bold font, et cetera. Well, you don't do that in HTML, you do that in CSS. So CSS specifies the visual layout and aesthetics of a web page. So that's what this uh, image here shows. So say, for example, the header. The header is usually like the main part of the web page, so you want to make it like look cool, right? So over here, I'm selecting for the H1 tag right here, and then I'm applying a background color of red and a font size of large. I know it's a bit small here, but I can't really zoom into this presentation, but that is what it's doing, right? I am selecting for the H1 tag by specifying H1, and then I'm applying CSS properties after that. And at its core, that's what CSS selectors do. It selects for specific parts of the HTML page, and then applies CSS properties to it. Now, we won't be worrying about those CSS properties, but the CSS selector comes into very handy for us, right? We need to locate specific parts of the HTML that have our data, and CSS selectors lets us do that because it lets us select for specific parts of the HTML. So now, hopefully that gave you a brief introduction as to web scraping and how it works. I'm gonna quickly jump over to a Jupyter Notebook where I'll be talking about the requests and beautiful soup libraries. Now, all of this material is available on the webpage for UCSAS. There's a GitHub link to my GitHub. So you can follow that to either clone it and then use the stuff there, or you can just follow along over here because I'll be going over the same thing. Now, after you find a data source, the first thing I mentioned is getting the HTML. That's what request lets us do. Request lets us send something called an HTTP get request. We won't get into the details of this, but just know that a get request lets you get the HTML content of a web page. So we'll be using request for that. The next step is obviously parsing through the HTML and then getting specific aspects of it. That's what beautiful soup lets us do, right? Beautiful soup lets us, uh, beautiful takes, uh, takes in CSS selectors and returns the specific HTML tags that correspond to those CSS selectors. And lastly, the pandas library is used to store your data, which many of you might be familiar with. So in this case, we'll be storing everything into a CSV file, but you can store it into many other file types. So let me just quickly jump over to the Jupyter Notebook, which is right here. Awesome. All right, so if you don't have the packages installed already, you can just use some simple pip commands here. Just pip install request, beautiful soup for, and pandas. Now, obviously, once you have these installed, uh, you have to import them. Now, the import statements are pretty common in terms of the syntax, but the beautiful soup one gets a little finicky, so I just want to explain that to make sure we're on the same page, right? So the package is called BS4, which is short for beautiful soup 4, and within that package, there's an object called beautiful soup. So from the BS4 package, we're importing the beautiful soup object. Now, if you're anything like me, I suck at typing and I'm very bad at spelling. So instead of having to type out beautiful soup every time, I'm just aliasing it as letters BS. So every time I want to refer to the object, I can just refer to letters B and S. And same thing with pandas. Instead of having to type out pandas every time, I can just refer to it as PD. So now we're going to make a data set, right? And I'll walk you through the general steps here. So the first step, obviously, is finding a data source, a web page. And don't worry, I already did that for you, which is this web page right here. So if we click on it and then go to it, my computer's a bit slow, right? So you can notice here that, well, there's a lot of data, right? So this is gonna be the top, I believe, 25 quarterbacks in the 2021 season, right? So we got Tom Brady up, up there, Justin Herbert, a lot of people. And there's clearly a lot of data stored in this table-like format, right? We have towards the left, the number of yards they pass and towards the right, the number of sacks and so much more. So this is some really useful information. And also, 
So if we click on specific players, right, say that we go to Tom Brady over here, it redirects us to the specific players page on NFL.com. So this is the page I was looking at before, and there's a good amount of data here that's not on the previous page. You have their height, their weight. Some of the data here is missing, but I mean, that's nothing new. You'll always find some missing data when going about your data source collection. So clearly there's a lot of data here. So I'm gonna walk you through how you're gonna web scrape all of that, right? Now, the last thing I wanna mention is look at the change in the URL. Ah, let's see if that goes away. So right now, this is the web page that we're currently on. When we click on a player link, the URL changes to something else. Right, it goes to Tom Brady's page URL. Before it was this uh, long subdomain. Uh, keep this in mind because this is pretty important for later on, but I do want to point that out right now. So now we just did the first step, which is finding a data source. So the second step is basically making a request to get the HTML. So it's syntactically speaking, it's pretty simple. You use the get command within the request library, so request.get, and you add on to the URL. So right there is NFL.com, which is the domain name, and then everything else, which is in the add-on variable, is the subdomain within NFL.com that has the web page that we were just looking at. So request.cat, essentially what it does is that clearly our web page is stored somewhere out there on the internet on some server. What .get does is that it makes a request to that server saying, hey, can I have the HTML of this web page? And it sends back a response. So I'm storing the response back in a variable called response. Now, if I run the cell, oh, I didn't import it. Always make sure you import the libraries. Give me a second here. Yes. So when I run the cell and I look at the type of the response, notice how it's a response object, which makes sense because the server is giving us some kind of response. Now, if I print out the status code here, right, you'll see it's a 200 status code. You might be familiar with other kinds of status codes, like a 404 code, right? That means that the server responded back saying that the page you're looking for isn't found. A 200 status code is like kind of the opposite. It says the page is found and here it is. So it's like an okay response, like you're perfectly good to go. Now, before I go, I do realize that I think all the outputs are there, so I'm just going to delete all the outputs so you don't get a sneak peek. Yes. Now, uh, like I said, the main thing we're looking for is the content of the web page, right? The HTML content, that's what we need. That's what we want to get in this step of the web scraping process. So response.content returns that out to us, and it's going to be pretty long, so my computer hopefully doesn't crash. Yeah. So you can see here that this is all the content of the web page, which is clearly a lot of information. But everything you see here is the web page and HTML that makes up this right here. So the content is what we need. So we've successfully finished the second step, right, which is getting the HTML content. Now, the third step is the step that's kind of the most like, it's the most nitpicky because there's a lot of stuff you have to do there. So I'm going to walk you through that part, which is parsing through the HTML with the help of CSS selectors. So we're going to use the beautiful soup object to do this. Right, so we pass into the beautiful soup object. Keep in mind that I aliased it as a BNS. We're gonna pass in the content of the HTML, which is response.content, and we're gonna specify to beautiful soup that I want you to parse through the HTML using your HTML parser, which basically creates some kind of tree-like structure that allows you to navigate and query the HTML document. Because everything in HTML, you can think of it as a tree because you have tags and there's tags nested within the tags. So it's all rooted and you, the, the, the general data structure is a parse tree, which we won't get into, but it's a really cool topic if you do wanna look into it. So over here, I'm creating a beautiful soup object called soup player stats, because that's the player stats page that we were going off of. And obviously the object is a beautiful soup object. So we now have an object, this beautiful soup object, that has the HTML stored within it. Now it's just a matter of querying everything so we can get specific parts of that. So we'll be using the dot select command. And what dot select does is that it takes in a CSS selector and it outputs everything that matches that CSS selector. So if I go back to the web page here, Everything here is clearly stored in a table. So let's just look at the HTML behind this. Uh, let's see. Right. So if I click on this little cursor command and then click elsewhere on the web page, it takes us to a specific part of the web page. And we can look at it more if we would like. But notice how there's something called a T body tag. A T body is just short for the table body, right? And then within this T body tag, we have a bunch of rows. So notice how as I hover over these rows, the specific rows in the table are being highlighted, which makes sense because this is where the HTML is pointing to towards all the data here. So I wanna get a CSS selector for the table, right? Because the table has all the data that I'm trying to scrape. So a simple way to do this, and Chrome makes it very easy, is that if you right click in and you go over to copy and you hit copy selector over here, this will copy the CSS selector that selects for the T body tag. And like I just showed, everything within the T body tag has all the rows of the data set that we're trying to web scrape. So if I hit copy selector here, 
It's already loaded in over here, but I can just copy and paste it here so you can see that's the same. Now, something to notice here is that this is a very long selector. There's a lot of like arrows, there's a lot of syntactical stuff going on, but also notice that you don't really need to know how to make a CSS selector to get a CSS selector, right? Most common browsers allow you to just copy the selector based off of inspecting the web page source. So when you run this, right, and then you print out how it's stored, it returns a list of everything that matched that CSS selector. Now, obviously, this isn't being printed and formatted in a pretty way, but you can notice here just from the general structure that it is a list and it's returning everything as a list. Now, an interesting thing that I do want to point out is that the length of this list is going to be one, right? And I think that's an important thing to specify because I'm only selecting for one tag, right? I'm only selecting for the T body tag. And though there's a bunch of nested tags within it, at the end of the day, I only generated a selector for one of the tags, which is T body, which is why it returned a list of length one. However, it's more useful for me to get a list of 25. So there's 25 quarterbacks in this web page, and as a result, there's 25 rows, right? So I can dive deeper by scraping that specific element, and that's what I'm doing over here. I'm selecting all the table rows, so that's what dot select tr does. It selects all the rows within that uh, t body tag, and it returns to me all those rows. So if I hit run here, notice how the length of this list is now 25 because it returned me 25 rows based off the 25 rows in the previous data set on the previous table. So I can show this to you, but it's not gonna make much sense just because it doesn't format it nicely. So let's just go back. So now let's look deeper into the HTML. So this right here is the row specifying Tom Brady, right? If you click on this arrow, it shows all of the data, right? So we have, for example, 7.4, which, which is the yards, and a lot of data here as we go along. So TD is data cell. Right, so we have a table and we have a table row and each row in the table consists of much multiple data cells. So once again, it makes sense to go even a level deeper and extract the data from the data cells. So that's what this next line over here does, right? The next line over here selects for all the data cells for now, just within the first row. So when I'm indexing, I'm selecting the first row, which is Tom Brady's row. And within Tom Brady's row, I'm selecting for all the TD cells, which are all the data cells within Tom Brady's row, right? Now, when I run this, once again, it's going to look like a lot of jargon, but notice how all the information is here. So we're getting closer to the data that we want, right? And there's a lot of information up here because Tom Brady's image is also there in the cell. If you look over here, there's Tom Brady's image. There's a link. We'll get more into how to clean that up a little bit later. But for now, if we were to access all the other elements, right? Uh, for example, his name, right? So his name is an important part that we want when scraping the web. And that's what this line does. If you look a bit closely, hopefully you can see this. There's an A tag right here, right? Within the A tag is Tom Brady's name. So by selecting the first element of the list, doing dot A, I get that A tag. And using dot string, I get that specific element within it. So notice how dot A gets me the A tag over here. And then with dot string, I'm able to return Tom Brady's name. So I just want to marvel this for, for, for a second, right? Because within the Python environment beforehand, we had nothing there outside of just like regular Python libraries and nothing. But over a course of a few lines, we're able to get Tom Brady's name into our Python environment and it's stored, right? I think that's pretty remarkable and that's just the power of web scraping. And you can really apply this for any website. Obviously in the theme of sports analytics, we're going off of uh, football here. Now everything else in the Python uh, list, right? So for example, all these different stats, not just his name is stored in a TD tag. And it's not useful to store in a T into a TD tag, right? You'd rather have it as like integers within a list that you can use later on. So that's what this function does right here. This is more related to regular Python. It doesn't have much to do with the request or beautiful soup library. So I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but essentially what I'm doing is that I'm looping through all these elements and I'm extracting the dot string element within it, right? So when I do so, all I'm doing here is that I get Tom Brady specific attributes and I'm also just going through every single element in the original list. So to break it down even more, previously I just focused on Tom Brady's row, but simply in this for loop, I'm going through all the rows in the data set and for each row of the data set, I'm extracting different data cell values and I'm just printing it out so you know when it's finished and when it's running. So right now we have all the data that was previously right here. So everything in this table is currently stored in our Python environment currently that, I mean, it's being printed out. So now let's move on to another step. If you remember from before, I mentioned how if you click on say Tom Brady's link, there's a change in the URL and it goes to another part of the website that's dedicated to Tom Brady. And there's also lots of useful information here that wasn't on the previous page. So say that you want that image, right? Well, there's a problem here, right? You can't click on it, right? I mean, at the end there, you're doing some kind of like Python manipulation, requesting the HTML and everything. There's no way you can tell Python to click on the actual link, right? So how do we fix this? 
Well, you fix this once again by using route HTML. So every A tag has something called an href element, right? So you can see over here that there's an href element called dash players backslash Tom Brady, which if you notice is the same as this string right here, right? So and the, way, the way you click elements using requests in Beautiful Soup is that you extract that href element and you append it onto the domain name, which in this case is nfl.com. And then you make a separate request for that specific web page. And you keep doing that over and over again. We'll talk about some of the positives and negatives for that. But just know that by accessing the href element, which, can, which you can do syntactically over here, right? So this returns that specific URL. All you can do there is that you have the href element, you add it onto the domain name, you make a separate request, then you use a separate beautiful soup object, and then you have a CSS selector that selects for your data. So though it's for a different web page, everything here we've just done for a, the previous web page, right? We previously made a request, we stored it into a beautiful soup object, and then we use CSS selectors to get all that data. Now this CSS selector is basically the selector that selects for this table right here. I already figured it out beforehand so that we could, uh, I wouldn't have to like show you because I showed you previously how to get a CSS selector, but that selector gets for all the data here. So when I run this, right, you'll see that for Tom Brady, we have his height, which is 6'4". We have his weight, 255. There's some missing values here and we have his hometown and some more missing values. But that's what this is doing here. We essentially just clicked on Tom Brady's link by making a separate request by accessing the href element. So now I'm going to do the same thing, except for all the players. So obviously that was for Tom Brady's row, but we're going to go to all the players over here. So now when I run this, it's going to take a little bit of time. I am running multiple applications at the same time, so it's going to take a few seconds. But notice how it's able to go through each of the links within the web page, click on it, right? I'm using quotation marks here because it's not technically clicking on it, accessing those tables, right, or values, and then printing them out. So you can see over here that, say, Justin Herbert, that's his height, and all this data is stored within his page of NFL.com, and request is able to, I guess, take that href attribute and make a separate request there. So yes, this finished up running, and so I'm doing the same thing as I'm doing up here, just looping through all the players in the table. So now we're getting to the last step. Right, so we use CSS selectors to find where our data is being located. We were able to make sure that everything's located properly and parse through the HTML. So we're almost there, and the last step is storing the data, right? And storing the data is pretty important because you wanna be able to access your data later on. So I'll be using the pandas library over here. Now, though it looks like a large chunk of code, we just did everything you see here, right? So what I'm doing is I'm making a request to that table, right, that table over here, right? But I'm just storing everything into a list. So over here, I'm making a list called pass yards and appending that specific position. So the very first element of the return list is the pass yards, which you can see uh, right here. The very second element is the yards over here. So that's what I'm passing over here. So though it looks just different because I'm using a different syntax to make it easier to read, everything that you see here we just did, I'm just appending it onto a list so that later on I can store it into a data set. Now, I'm not going to run this for a few reasons. One, if you look down here, I'm also doing that clicking thing I talked about earlier. Clicking it takes a lot of time. Because if you think about it, we're sending a separate uh, request every single time, and every single time we're parsing it, we're parsing different web pages, and every single time we're storing different data, and we're doing that same thing 25 times, right? So it takes up a lot of time and computational power, but that's just the way you have to do it in requests in Beautiful Soup. So I'm not gonna run this just, for the, just because it's gonna take a while, but at the end of the day, after you get all that data, you can use a simple pandas library. Uh, you can use this pandas library to store everything into a data frame, which is what this is doing right here. And then after that, oh yeah, what's your so I would say, obviously this is going to be open because it's going through the entire list over here, but also within the list itself, we're going through another separate yeah, get request. Now get request uh, takes a while just because it has to contact the server and come back to you. So I'm not sure how long that will take. It really depends on the server itself. But theoretically right here, it is O of N. It's just the fact that because a request takes varying amount of time, it's gonna add on more on top of that. So it's nested. So it's O of N times a certain amount. Now, um, yeah, like I said, the data is being stored in the data frame here. And then I'm saving everything here to a CSV file. So to just to show you how that looks over here, right? So this is all the data that we previously scraped. Right? And now everything is actually stored in a file that you can use. There's a lot of missing values here. Some of the data isn't formatted properly. But once again, that's the steps later on in the process. Right? Later on, you clean it. Later on, you pre-process it and model it. For now, we're just getting data. And that's what we've successfully done here. Right? So all the data that was stored in those individual lists, we were able to convert it to a data frame. And then from there, we're going to use this later on.
So that's it for requests and beautiful soup there. So moving on, one of the packages that I was talking about before was Selenium and SQL. Now, like I said, Selenium and SQL are very powerful. They have, when they came out, they kind of like just transformed the way you interact with the web. So it's very revolutionary in terms of the way they work. So I don't want to go so deep into them because it is pretty confusing. But in essence, right, Selenium allows you to actually interact with a web browser. Previously, I talked about how you can't really click in Request and Beautiful Soup, but you can in Selenium, right? Because the way Selenium works is that it connects to a Chrome executable. So I'll be using Chrome. You can also use Firefox or anything else. You can download these executables online by just search, searching up like downloading Chrome drivers. And then basically by connecting to the driver, it's able to interact with the web page itself. I'll show you how that works in a bit. The next package is SQLite 3. It's a built-in package into Python and allows you to do SQL queries in Python itself. Now, SQL allows you to query databases. It's just basically a database is a collection of tables, and that's what SQL allows you to do. It allows you to query different tables within a database, right? So combining Selenium and SQL is very powerful, so that's what I'm going to show you right now. Once again, the purpose of this isn't to get too caught up on, like, the technical aspects, but it is to just... I can't open this, yes. But it's just to show you that there's, like, a lot of powerful stuff out there. So to briefly run through the code here, right? Let me just zoom in a little bit. All I'm doing is importing Selenium, and then I'm creating some SQL tables, right, using Python. So over here are some SQL tables that have the player stats and then the player info, so those two little web pages I showed you beforehand. And then I'm connecting to a Chrome executable. So I have already downloaded beforehand, right? So the Chrome executable is stored in this path location with a .exe extension. And then from there, I'm loading in this web page, which is the same web page as before. And then basically from there, I'm using a whole bunch of like CSS selectors to access specific parts of that table, which once again, we just went over. And then after that, I'm executing this command, inserts all the data into the SQL table. So if I were to quickly run this, let's see, hopefully my VS Code terminal runs. Alrighty. Uh, Wait, no? Let me open up the folder because it's not going directly into that. Okay. Sorry, my computer gets very slow. Yeah, so as you can see, my Chrome executable is over here. And now when I run this program, give me a second. <laughs> So when I run this, oh, I spelled Python wrong. Like I said, I'm very bad at spelling. Uh, so you can see here, like I'm not doing anything, but it's able to interact with the Chrome browser, right? And soon you're going to see a pop-up, right? So it loads that specific URL. There's a pop-up, so I click later onto it. It's going to take a few seconds. I click later, and then now it's going through the entire data set, and it's extracting those elements and it's storing it into that SQL database that I mentioned before. Notice also how it's able to click on those links, right? So it's clicking on the Tom Brady link, extracting that data, and then it's going back and then going through the exact same process, ex except for a different quarterback this time, right? So it goes through those individual elements, and it keeps doing that over and over again until it reaches the end of the table, because that's the way I programmed it to do. Now, like I said, this is going to take a while to do just because my computer is super slow, but uh, I have already run this program before, so all the data is stored in a database already. But hopefully this, this is pretty cool, at least in my opinion. You can do a lot of powerful stuff with here. All I'm doing is just clicking and going back, but you can just imagine you can search stuff up and you can make your own bots that do a lot of stuff in terms of scraping data set from different types of websites. You can open up new tabs, go to different URLs, get data from different sources and put them onto a different database. Are you going? Oh, okay. Oh, no, you're good. Mm -hmm. Uh, like a box folder, so the PDF, mm -hmm. is that an easy workaround? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it definitely is. But this, like, the power of Selenium is just that you can access any website through the Chrome browser itself. So it's easier to just send a request uh, separately just with Selenium because it allows you to actually interact with the web page. Does that answer your question? Like, you have the web page and then you have the PDF. Oh, so if there's a PDF already in the web page, yeah, because you, you can select with this. So with Selenium, you can also interact with JavaScript, which I'm not going to go in. But like I said, with JavaScript also, a lot of the web is kind of like rendered in JavaScript as well. You can use like React, for example, to load in different types of HTML components. So if your PDF is something like that, Selenium allows you to interact with it. So it's very powerful. It's very versatile. Um, so let me just uh, execute this and then terminate the program. Now, like I said, everything here was stored in a SQL database, right? 
So like, I'm gonna open up SQLite Studio just to show you like the full process. So all the here, all the data here was stored into a database called Quarterbacks Master, right? Now I can execute basic SQL commands and get all the data from there. Well, so this is just a simple select from this table, and I can do even something even more complicated, such as selecting and then using some kind of condition and joining on a specific key or ID column, right? Once again, the purpose of this isn't to go into SQL, isn't to go into Selenium, but just to show you the full process of how you can use Selenium and SQL to get some pretty good insights. So within the last few minutes, let me just pull up the presentation again. All right, so within the last few minutes, I'm going to quickly, all right, so we're on time. Yeah, within the last few minutes, I'm just going to quickly go over the legality of web scraping. Now, I do think this is a very, it's like one of those important topics, right? That's a very important topic nonetheless, right? Like I just said, it's not legal to web scrape every single web page out there. There's a lot of web pages you can't web scrape. Right there are a few examples of some lawsuits that like happened when certain companies or certain people scrape data from a website that they weren't allowed to. Not saying that you guys will get a lawsuit on you. I really hope you guys don't. If you do, I just want you guys to know that I'm not responsible for that. But to just to just like kind of like, I guess, expose you to the idea that be careful out there because not all data is public, even though it is invisible to you. So a good way of knowing whether or not you can scrape a web, right? Many government sites have freely publicly available data sets that you can use, right? They also have APIs. You might have to register for an API key, but you can get data from there as well, right? But a good source that I always use is something called a robots.txt file that's attached to the domain of a web page. I'll talk about that right now. So say LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn has a lot of data. It has tremendous amounts of data, right? Just on people, on companies, on specific job applications, lots of data. But if I want to web scrape it, right? Well, I'm going to get my LinkedIn account banned. And here's why. So let's go to LinkedIn.com. Uh, yes. LinkedIn. I'm going to go. I'm going to go over to Chrome because I like Chrome better. So LinkedIn.com/robots.txt. Right. So LinkedIn.com is obviously the domain name, and robots.txt is just a subpart of the domain. Now, if I click enter, and yeah, you can notice here, uh, let me just zoom in a little, right? The use of robots or other automated means to access LinkedIn without the express uh, permission of LinkedIn is strictly prohibited. Right? I mean, this explicitly says don't scrape LinkedIn. Even the data is publicly available of sorts, right? You don't really need a LinkedIn account, perhaps, to see job applications or something. LinkedIn explicitly tells you you shouldn't scrape our web, so don't do it. <laughs> Right? If we go to NFL.com that we were previously just web scraping, NFL.com slash robots.txt, which I already have, right? I want you to know something important here, right? There's a user agent and then there's a wild star. This basically says all users, no matter who they are in terms of like robots or automated means, cannot web scrape from these following URLs. So you can't web scrape from NFL.com slash account, or you can't web scrape from NFL.search or slash search. But also notice down here, nfl.com slash stats slash players. That's what we were previously web scraping. So basically, I'm going to get kicked out. I'm sorry, but I had to sacrifice my account for this, right? No, I'm kidding. Uh, if you look at the actual thing, it says Media Partners Google, right? So basically, if you're working for like Google, say Google AdSense or like the Google search engine or something like that, you're not allowed to web scrape this. But anyone else is, right? I wish I was working for Google, but I'm not. But so I'm allowed to web scrape this. So I guess there are some pros to not working for Google, right? <laughs> so, uh, that's just a quick introduction to the robots.txt. There's a lot more syntactical stuff that goes into it. So there are a few resources that I gave towards the end of the presentation in terms of how you can read a robots.txt file. Now, once again, requests in Beautiful Soup are far more complicated, and there's so many different more things you can do with it. So hopefully you guys got some motivation in terms of just how it works, how to get data from a web page, and how to go through that process on making a data set, even though we did just make a far more simpler data set. So that's it for this presentation. There are more resources here and on the actual UCSAS website. So I hope you guys got any, something from this. And we do have a few minutes left, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. Yeah. So if I go back to that NFL page, right? Oh, boy, where's my Chrome? Yeah, right here. That's not Chrome. Uh, okay, so if I go back to the NFL page over here, notice how only 25 are being displayed here. But if you go to next page, look at the change in the URL, right? It's a different URL. So you're going to have to do the same thing of clicking, right? Where you, 
uh, get that specific element, get the href element appended on, and now you now you get the request element for this entire web page. Then you get the next 25, then you go back down here. So it's an iterative process, so it's just a for loop. Every time in the for loop, you get the next page every time. So that's how you'd create a data set of even more quarterbacks. Oh, I only did 25 here just because it takes time for it to scrape through. Mm -hmm. I think there was another, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, depends on what it says. So if it says like user, if it says allow with the backslash, then everything is allowed. If it says disallow with the backslash, then nothing is allowed. Yeah. So I, th I think for like LinkedIn, it's like not allowed with a backslash, which means basically everything after the domain name, which is literally everything on a web page, is not allowed. Yeah, it's like that. So yeah, you can't scrape NB, I believe. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so, yeah, so it depends on the amount of data that you took and just like how you're using the data. So I know that every time you send a request, the server gets an, the IP address of where it's sending the information to. So every time I send a request here, then it gets like my IP because that might just be the way it's getting the request from. So maybe, for example, LinkedIn, they can get your IP, ban your account, or they might not. I mean, it really depends on the security features. I'm not a big expert on that. So, I mean, I don't know if that's even true, but like if they do get your power, like your information from there, then they could be in your account. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, are there a few, any more questions? If not, move around, all right. <clears throat> 